Thank you very much for taking the time <coughs> and being here. So Professor Huerta is uh, from the Technical University of uh, Catalonia in Barcelona. I, I attempted, or I thought about attempting saying it in Spanish. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. Well, thank you all uh, for being here. Um, I hope that at the end of the morning you are not all disappointed by uh, this three-hour uh, seminar. Uh, after talking with Marek, I, we decided to, to put several things, and um, it's going to be a little bit difficult because some of them I will cover them quite uh, with a very low frequency, long, long wavelength, OK? and others I will go into more in detail. Those that are more documented, I will cover them in a rather quick way, and others that are less documented or more recent, I will try to be a little bit more didactic, okay? But in any case, I'm going to talk on parametric engineering uh, problems that is or model order reduction, a, a very particular topic on model order reduction. Uh, and I'm going to talk on low and high order approximations, in particular for fluids, even though, as you will see, I'm going to talk on solids. And um, even if the abstract is written in the other way around, I'm going to begin by the model order reduction and then move on to the, to the high order, low order. Model order reduction, uh, for instance, if th there are plenty of books, but I I'm going to concentrate on proper orthogonal uh, proper generalized decomposition, and this is one of these books uh, done at Chisholm in Udine after one week course, and you can find things on reduced basis by uh, Gianluigi Rozza, uh, who is a great scientist and an expert in this field, as others that you have here in, uh, in Aachen. And uh, you have also an introduction to PGD and a very brief introduction to, to POD. In any case, um, what, I'm, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in solving uh, problems like these ones, problems where we have parameters, okay? And these parameters, this mu here, can be in the material properties, can be in the external forces, or uh, can also be in the geometry. The geometry may, may depend on those parameters. And what we want, that's typical in engineering, what we actually want is to be able to solve for any of those values of these parameters. The whole point here is that all of these, at the end, is, I'm going to say it in a, in a while, all these parametric solutions, all those techniques, are going to be a commodity to solve other engineering problems. This is going just to be a tool that we will be needing to optimize or to design in engineering. Um, so that's the problem that I'm willing to, to solve. And of course, what I want is to obtain the solution you which will depend, in this case, in space, and also in all these parameters. So it actually lives in a quite large dimensional space, okay? Imagine a simple 2D problem with only two parameters. I'm already in a 4D problem if I want to discretize everything. So uh, the classical approach is that w what we... Uh, come on in. The classical approach is that we, we all know how to solve this using finite elements. You give me one set of parameters, I plug the parameters, and I solve it. And we are all used to write the solution 
as a linear combination of some shape functions that we know, that we impose from the beginning, times some coefficients, that's good, that is, that's easy. Uh, if we have time, now those coefficients will depend on time. That's something that we all know. And actually, Pierre Ladevez, like what, uh, 30 years ago, already began opening the door or do, of doing things a little bit different. What he said is, instead of computing this parameter at each time step, which is what we are used to do, why don't we try to find a function in time, the whole function in time, that multiplies these, uh, these shape functions in space? And this is what he called the Latin method, and it's used by his group in, uh, in nonlinear problems, in transient nonlinear problems for solid mechanics. But that's not what we are going to do. What we are going to follow is the same idea. What if we put some functions here that depend on mu and rewrite everything like this? Well, this is not a very drastic change. In fact, if I want to solve, think space-time, for instance, eh? and some of you are working in space-time here. These are going to be my shape functions in space, my shape functions in time, and these are the coefficients that I have to compute. The number of points now are in the 4D space of space and time. Okay? So that's, that's, that's an option, and in this case what I'm assuming is that these functions m and n are a priori known. I am I'm imposing them. Okay? Uh, of course I can go a little bit further and say, well, maybe I don't know them, maybe I can sample them, maybe I can obtain them, and this is the way reduced basis, in a sense, is built up. I begin to, to I obtain some of these functions because I train my surrogate model, that's the standard language that we will use, and once I have those functions, I will put this, plug this in into the equations and solve for the coefficients. We don't follow that approach. We follow a different approach. The approach we want to follow is this one. What we do is same idea. We decompose in space, we decompose in functions in the parameters, but now those two functions are unknowns. This is an unknown and this is an unknown. And we want to solve them completely on their own. What is the advantage? The advantage is that once I have computed these functions, which I hope I'd have much less number of functions than number of points in my 4D mesh. Once I've solved these functions, any evaluation of the approximation is going to be trivial and fast. Because I only need to evaluate those functions, multiply them, and sum them. I don't need to solve any extra problem. Anytime I need to do a sensitivity analysis, how is the temperature, the displacements, the velocities, or functions of this, the stresses on a surface, how is this changing when I'm changing mu? Well, I can compute derivatives. Those functions, I have computed them, they are known. So numerically, I can compute the derivatives of these functions. Okay? So the big advantage of the technique that we are using is that everything for the post-process, for what we call the online computations, all of this is done very fast and it's quite trivial. Where is the catch? The catch is that computing these functions is sometimes not easy at all. Okay? But that's, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is that we are going to, to try to solve for, for these functions that we have here and this is a good reference. We call that the computational vademecum, because doctors have this vademecum where every time you get sick and they need to find which is the proper uh, medicine for you, they open this big book and look for the components. So th this is the computational one. It's like an abacus, but, but, uh, but compu computerized. Anyway, so uh, as I was saying at the beginning, the use order methods are going to be in in any of their different techniques, because there are different options, and some of them are easier than others, and so on. But reduced order methods are going to become standard in any courses 
on uh, engineering and computational analysis. It's going to be a tool that we will be using in the future. Um, we use this computational parametric in order to get an explicit parametric solution. And of course, as I said, afterwards you can compute sensitivities, you can use it for other problems. And I'm going to, to show you a couple of examples of these, uh, of these problems. Well, the challenges, of course, is that every, every time you have a new problem, you have to rethink of it. This is good, this gives us work. For instance, to Karen and me, every time that there is a new problem and we want to approach it by any other technique, you have to look at the problem and begin to know how to separate, because it's very sensitive on the way we are going to separate the, the solutions. How, how do we pair X and Y, or shall we put X, Y and T together and then leave the parameters together? In a while we will be discussing the pressure, shall have functions different from the velocity in an in a incompressible problem, depending on the parameters. So every problem we may have a different optimal separation approach. Of course, we need to have something which is very well discussed in a book by, um, by Tony Patera and, and Gianluigi Rozza, which is the affine parameter dependence, the bilinear form have to be separated. If the, we are not able to write them as a sum of products of functions, x and mu, we are dead. So we need to do that even if the problem is nonlinear. Okay? And that's also one of the big issues. Anyway, so and, and obtaining the desired accuracy is also a problem. But let, let, let me go through some examples. Look, this is a very simple example. This is a shell. And in this shell, oops, go back. This is a shell. I have in this shell, um, a probe, I have a probe, and this probe is sitting here, and it's measuring temperature. And on the uh, outside part, which is quite typical of, of building composites, I have a laser, and this laser is moving around and being a source of heat. One of the big issues, and Airbus and all the big companies uh, building uh, composites have, is the quality control. They have to throw tons and tons of composite pieces because sometimes they are not, they don't conform to the, to the quality control. And if, for instance, this is the case where I have a small crack here and the temperature, the temperature, this is the temperature in time measured here. Without a crack is the red line, with a small crack is the blue line, with a large crack like the one we see here is the green line. So each crack will have a signature. Okay, but I want to do this extremely fast. I want to be able to, measuring temperature I can do it fast, but at, at the same time I want to know if the temperature I'm measuring gives me some information of a crack or not. Is it the theoretical one or not? So I have to be able to compute temperature very fast at this point when a source of heat is traveling along this surface. Now to do that, if you go back to your uh, math courses, one, two, three, four, five, there was something strange called the green functions. Eh? Green functions was a magic thing to solve PDEs. Okay? Well, engineers also call them transfer functions. Uh, the idea is that I'm able to compute the temperature at the point that I want, x0, for any instant t, by simply integrating along the external uh, surface where I put the external load Q, my load Q, times a magic function H, which depends on the position X, which depends on time, which depends on a frequency, and then depends on, on X zero. This is actually, uh, actually this is a T, there is a mistake here. There, there should be a time here, a, a tau. A tau should be here. Uh, this is the transfer function, and this transfer function is nothing else than the inverse Fourier transform of this. Uh, this is the inverse Fourier transform of h hat. And h hat is the green function, is the solution of this problem here. And this problem here has, I have to solve it for every frequency omega, then I will integrate for all the frequencies between minus infinity and plus infinity. But if I solve this where I have put a delta, a direct delta at the x0 when I want to measure, 
I am able to find the green function, the transfer function. I'm able to compute the temperature at any instant at position x0 where the Dirac delta is put. Now, if I have a technique to solve this problem here, approximated, of course, not exact, and it, this technique allows me to obtain solutions for x and for omega for the frequency, and I solve it for all the frequencies at once, I can plug back this definition in here. You see that I w the integral, the, the, the function of x will come out of the integral in omega, and I simply need to integrate this function in omega, plug it with the q which is known, and obtain the temperature at the point. So at the end it's very easy. I have used my PGD, I have used my reduced order model to solve for the green function. So it's a technique inside of a box. This is my approximation that I plug into my transfer function and I obtain the temperature. Okay. Is this working fast enough for real-time evaluations? The answer is yes. If this moves, yes. This is the temperature computed with a abacus, so half of your life computing, I mean, two days computation, because this is a very thin shell, different uh, properties, okay, so it takes a long time. And in blue, let me rerun the code again, in blue you have the different solutions obtained with this technique. This is the actual time, the real engineering time, this is the computational time. So thanks to the fact that I have an explicit solution of the Green's function, and therefore doing the inverse Fourier transform is easy, the convolution afterwards is even easier also. Thanks to all of that, I am able to run faster than real time. Okay, so reduce order models allows you to do things like that. But they also allow you to do things this, like this one. This is a harbor, and these are the waves hitting a harbor. And I want to study the problem for different angles for different heights of the waves and for, for different frequencies of the waves. This is a Hemholtz problem, so it's in a, an unbounded domain, so it's, it's not easy to solve it even just for one omega, one theta and one height. Those constants here, the problem is linear, they don't depend on the solution u, but they depend on the depth in a very nonlinear way. Okay? So solving this problem in itself is solving a system of equations which is not nice. Okay? We have to put the right boundary conditions uh, and solving it many times, that's something that is really not, not worth it. And again, if we are able to find an explicit approximation, we can, this is just a video taken in real time from the, ca from the screen, you change the direction, you change the frequency, and you get the solution, and you can see that the solution is extremely sensitive to the, to the directions and frequencies. Why is this important? Because this happens, I mean, and this is not in the Atlantic Sea, this is this toy sea called the Mediterranean Sea, okay? I'm, the, I'm saying toy because, I mean, it's a small, waves are small, I mean, you don't have the huge problems that you have, but this is in a harbor in Israel, and as you can see, some days you cannot work. The cranes cannot work, okay? And we had a similar problem in Barcelona. This is the big harbor of Barcelona. For those of you that have been in Barcelona, the Ramblas are here, okay? Is, is this street here? These are the Ramblas, okay? And this is, this is the Olympic Harbor. This is another harbor that was built close to the Forum, which these are private boats, okay? The, I mean, big boats. Uh, actually, most of the rich people leave their, in winter their boats over there because, uh, the, I mean, it was cheap. Now, the problem was these guys don't want to have coffee in the, on their deck and uh, all the coffee vibrating. So you have to know exactly if the harbor is well protected and how many days you will be able to use all the different areas. So that's a pure economic problem, okay? So what you need to do in those cases is to study for each, this is for the same angle, different 
periods, different frequencies of the, of the waves, different, different heights. What we do know, because we have measured that, is the probability that we can have this value, and the probability of this, and the probability of that. And we have to study for all the range of parameters, all the probabilities, to be able to have an information of, in this area of the harbor, in this area over here, for instance, which is red, there will be 20 days, 100 days a year, where the waves are going to be higher than this value, and you cannot use it for that purpose. You can use it for another one, but not for this one. Okay? And that has strong implications on is it worth building a harbor or not? Okay. Again, how do you do that? You do Monte Carlo, and Monte Carlo needs sometimes plenty of evaluations. Again, being able to do that is very, is very fast if you have reduced order models. Let's move into solid problems. Welding. This is a code by ESI. The idea is, if I want to, 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 to make a welding, what I do is I concentrate, it's, this is simple, eh? the heat equation, transient heat equation, but I have a source term here, which depends on plenty of things. The energy, the, that's the width of the laser at that distance, the velocity at which I'm moving the, the laser, and what I want to do, what actually they do, they have been doing, is to solve by finite elements all the process of this laser moving along and welding an area. Okay? It's a nightmare because, I mean, it's a problem which is the thermal problem, which is the only one I'm concentrating here, is already difficult. But then you have all the different problems, the mechanical problems, the phase changing that you have to solve, and all of those are nonlinear. I'm just showing you the, the, the thermal one. Um, again, the idea is I want to do that, and I don't want to have a mesh extremely fine to capture this all over the area. I can have a very coarse mesh outside this area. I want to refine here. And of course, the blunt thing is to refine, and every time, another time step, I refine again. And if now you want to change the parameters, you begin from scratch. Okay? Well, instead of doing that, the idea was to enrich this area. To enrich this area, and to do that, you could use techniques like the generalized finite elements, which is standard finite elements, Plus, at each node, I introduce functions which enrich the solution. That's a standard and classic. Okay? And I can do that. that. The problem that it has is that it increases, a lot, it increases a lot the degrees of freedom. At each node, I put more degrees of freedom. I have to choose the right functions. Those functions should not be collinear with the previous ones because then I may have uh, ill conditioning on my matrices, and so on and so on. So the idea is, why don't we put, instead of a bunch of functions, uh, this is what the effect. This is the standard generalized finite element. So you have the linear shape functions, my enrichment function. I multiply these, uh, these two so that the support of the enriched function is just the support of the, of the interpolation function. And I get something which is richer, and I can put some uh, analytical information in it. Or for instance, this is the extended finite element. I can, developed by uh, Nicolas Moes, John Dolbo, and Ted Balichko in Northwestern, uh, I add a, a discontinuity. Okay, so my shape functions, a heavy side function representing the discontinuity, and now I have something which has only this support which represents the discontinuity. The idea is, how many extra functions shall I put? The cost increases with the number of these extra functions. In order to define, I have to be able to, to not make mistakes, as I said, with the conditioning numbers. And there are a bunch of options. What we do is simply choose one very smart extra function. That's the whole point. And how, why do I, I mean by very smart extra function? A function like this one, which is Parametric in what? In the velocity, in the amplitude of the heat that I'm imposing, in all the parameters that I had, in the width of my light laser, and also on all my boundary conditions. So I have a solution inside this small patch where you give me the velocity, you give me the power of the laser, you give me the amplitude of the laser, and you give me the boundary conditions, 
I can give you the solution inside. And that's very expensive, but I only do it once. Okay? And then, when I go online, I plug this solution with the external coarse mesh solution. And they only talk through the boundary conditions, which are data for this one. Okay? So only one extra function that allows me to be able to model the heat. So look at the difference between the function in this area where it's far away from the boundary to this one where I have some heat also introduced on this boundary. It changes completely and on the outside. Okay? So it, take, it adapts itself to the environment, which is, which is important. And you see the coarse mesh here and the enriched solution over there. And it's already, the message is, is already implemented in a commercial code by, by ESI. The last example that I want you to see in this, in this quick view of uh, reduced order models. No, the last, no. one to the last. Uh, this is a technique, w one big advantage that we have been found in doing this separation and reduced order models is problems where you have two very different lengths. One x, in this case, one y. This is typical of composites. And you have a bunch of, of layers. And for instance, for this problem, the conductivity of one layer is 10 times larger than the other. So if you have to mesh this and to solve this with some precision, you have to refine drastically along this direction. And you don't need to refine along this one. And on top of that, you may have parameters. This, k, this case may be a priori unknown, and you want to do the inverse problem, for instance. Okay? So the solution is going to be written as the product of in-plane, out-of-plane, and then all the parameters that you may want. Okay? And this is a test that applied mathematicians have been using for a long time. This is the problem. Uh, that this is a fin that has been studied for a long time. We have complicated it a little bit with these different properties in plane, out of plane. But the idea is we want to solve problems like these ones very fast. And any, any engineer can see that there, are, there is some repro reproducibility here, that I can see some subdomains here. Okay? So what we do is look at those domains okay, and say, look, maybe these are three different problems, if I can solve each one of them and do a, so, a sort of domain decomposition type of approach, things can be solved in a very easy way. And that's what we do. We take the heat equation. Instead of solving it in the whole domain, like here, we are going to split the domain. That means that my problem now is written. Let's go back. My problem now is written for any of the domain decompositions, I have to put some transmission conditions so that the problem is exactly the same. Temperature should be continuous between those two sides, and the flux of heat should be the same between two connecting bodies. And I add an extra unknown you had. So what I'm going to do is take this problem, say, I don't know you had. I'm going to put, instead of you had any polynomial that you may want, linears, quadratics, cubics, OK? If it's a polynomial, it has coefficients. Those are going to be my parameters. And I'm going to solve this problem with some unknown parameters which characterize this boundary condition. And then the only thing I have to do is glue them and impose the continuity of the temperature and the flux of heat. So only one global problem with unknowns, the temperatures on the interfaces, period. Why? Because I have a generalized and explicit solution inside each of the domains. Okay? And this allows me to solve this problem by only solving two rectangulars with different boundary conditions. I solve only two. And I have to solve one global problem very fast I ov obviously can use newton raphson because my solutions now I can compute the derivatives. So I can compute the Jacobian of the, 
of the matrix for the newton raphson technique and converge in a couple of iterations. So everything works fine. I can do it for linears and see the error map. And of course, if I do it for cubics, the error map converges. And of course, I want to do this not for a fin, a toy problem, but for Airbus. This is the typical situation of Airbus where, where I have a heat source here and this boundary layer and, and different boundary conditions. And this external thing is where the composite is with all these different properties. And I have to match the correct discretization for the composite with the correct discretization for all the, for all the beams which are as rigidizers and they have a continuum model. All of this, matching all of this for any value of the parameters is a nightmare. If I do it with an explicit solution, I can obtain the correct answers very fast. Okay? Now, the last example. The last example is, and I use it to become more fluid, okay? Uh, so this is a Stokes problem, and I want to solve the Stokes problem, again, with viscosities and external forces depending on the parameters. And uh, well, this is the typical, for those of you have, that have done uh, finite elements in fluids, I use capital A's and B's because now I'm integrating in X and mu. My parameters are in the X, in the space, but also in the dimension of the parameters, okay? But this is the typical viscosity matrix. This is the gradient of the, of the pressure, and this is the divergence of the velocity. So the classical Stokes problem uh, that, I have, that I have to solve. Now, uh, in order to do that, what people have done is the, the classical approach has always been to say, look, let's look at each one of the components of the velocity and do, and for the pressure, and do what I just explained. Write it as a sum of functions in space times functions in the parameters. Uh, the parameters, as I said, can be the geometry, can be the external loads, can be the viscosity. Okay? So each component of the velocity is multiplied, uh, it has two functions, the space one and the parametric one. And uh, the pressure has also a, a, a good, another one. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. There is a paper, you can look at the paper for the details, but let me very briefly sketch you why it doesn't work. If you compute the divergence of the velocity, you have to compute the derivative, let's go back here, the derivative of this function with respect to x plus the first component with respect to x, the second component with respect to y, the third component with respect to, to z, okay? So that's what, I'm doing. that's what I'm doing here. The sum along the spatial di directions of fi partial with respect to xi. But each one of these components has a different L, a different parametric function. And I may have five or six parametric functions there. Okay? So my divergence of the velocity that I have here is somehow weighted by these parametric functions. This means several things. But the most important one is that I cannot use commercial codes anymore. Every time I need to compute the divergence, I have to sit down, open the code, and begin to code myself. It's very intrusive uh, in a commercial code, a technique like this one. Okay? Now, if I do a completely different approach and say, look, let's go back here. Instead of putting different functions for each component of the velocity and for the pressure, for the parameters, I'm going to use exactly the same function. Okay? Each component of the velocity and the pressure will always have the same parametric function. If I do that, and I compute the divergence, my only function comes out of the divergence, and the only thing I have to check is that the spatial modes, the spatial functions that characterize the velocity, are divergence-free. So now I can call an external code. I can be non-intrusive, and I will show you some examples in open form by the end of the, of the seminar. I can be non-intrusive and use commercial codes to do PGD model reduction. 
Okay? But for that, I need to use the same function in all of the components. Now, the beauty of it is that this space is not smaller than the previous one. It may need more terms to capture everything, but it's not smaller than the previous one. It's the same approximation space. Okay? So I can do that, and this works. The message is that this works. This is what the Brinkman model. The Brinkman is a mixture of Stokes and Darcy. You see here, this is the Stokes part, and this is the Darcy part. And it's used typically in geophysical problems. Okay? And there is a test, which is this uh, SPE10, which is set up by the Society of Petroleum Engineers to check uh, which are real data. And this real data, let me show it here. This is the test. This is the permeability. Actually, this is the power of 10 of the permeability. So the permeability is something to the power of, and it goes from mi minus 2 to 4. Six orders of magnitude in changing the permeability. Okay? <coughs> That's a typical test. And these guys here proposed to study this problem in case there is some fracking or simply some uh, dissolution of a material inside. And suddenly you have a hole in the domain. Okay? Things change. And to do that, we introduce a parameter. We introduce a parameter mu, which changes the, the permeability. And this is why you have here, for the largest value of the parameter, I have a hole. My permeability now is of order 6, which is no, almost no permeability, very small. Okay? And therefore, now my orders of magnitude go from minus 2 to 6. And I want to solve it for all possible values of the permeability here that move from the untouched in situ situation to I've built up a hole. And I want to know if I can do it easily, fast, and uh, accurately. And that's the solution for the in situ situation or for the hole. You can see the difference in the values of the velocity, the values of the pressure. But what I want you to really look at is the relative error of the velocity and the relative error of the pressure in these two extreme values of the parameters. And as you can see, we are talking errors 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 12, 14, 8. So either machine or minus 8. Okay. So this separation of the velocity and pressure actually works. Okay. So to finish a little bit this part of model order reduction, and I'm going on time because now it's 9.30. Good. No, 9.13 is not 9.13. I see, see, see. That's perfect. That's perfect. We are, going, we are doing good. We are doing good. So let me, let me summarize what, uh, what I've been telling you. This model order reduction, I'm sure that it's going to be in every soup in the next uh, years, and, uh, and everybody is going to use it. That's, that's something that, that's clear. Uh, we use these explicit parametric solutions because they give us the advantage to have, we use all the methods. We use uh, POD, we do reduce order basis, uh, we, we reduce basis, uh, and, and we use PGD. But most of the problems we use, if we can't use PGD, we use it because of these explicit expressions, okay? And there are plenty of challenges and plenty of PhD thesis to be done in the area, just to let you know. Um, so plenty of work. So let me move to, to low and high order, okay? Here we are going to spend some more time. Um, what is better, low, or high or low order or high order? There was a big discussion. Reynald Lerner was involved. Spencer Sherwin was involved, were involved. And there was a big discussion, and, uh, and nobody was agreeing. Okay? So we, we wrote a paper, this paper here, in uh, 2013 where we counted the number of floating point operations, which is not correct. I mean, it's, it's better than the asymptotic analysis that this is order of n cube and so on. It's better than, than the asymptotic analysis because we don't have any constants in front of it, and in order to compare, it's important not to have constants. 
So it's better than the runtime because runtime depends on the way you have coded and the machine you are working on. Uh, it doesn't take into account the memory, the, the, the MFLOP operations, the, the memory operations, okay, which are also very important. Right? But at least it was able to tell us that if you use a sequential uh, computer, what method will be better? Wh which one has, has to do more or less operation? And in fact, for high order methods, let me do a step. For high order methods and discontinuous galerking, um, this is on the safe side. That is, discontinuous galerking have a structure which is, opt which is good for the type of computers that we have. Okay? And therefore, they are going to run faster than just counting the flops. That's, that's the message. Okay? But in any case, counting flops, high order is in general better than low order. If, if your solution is smooth. Okay? If your solution is non-smooth, then you have to take that into account. I mean, by adding artificial diffusion, adaptivity, whatever. Okay? So, but on a comparison that we can do analytically with um, smooth solutions, high order is always better than, than low order. Obviously, more in 3D than in 2D. For engineering accuracy, that you, that's the case. Uh, every time there is a global solve, high order is much more important than low order. If you are in element uh, by element operations, in uh, explicit codes, for instance, you have this tendency to be in favor of low order. But if you use some factorization that is straight side edges and things like that, and you benefit from those things, high order is again better. The only case we found where low order was better than high order was for explicit codes and nonlinear problems and curved elements. But you need to have all the ends. Eh? It's not or, it's end. If you have all those things, then low order is better. So in general, however, in, sp in spite of some major issues, which is we have problems constructing meshes. We have sometimes problems with the memory in high order problems. And the stencils usually are not good for the condition numbers. Okay? That's something that we still are working on. And this is one of the challenges of the NASA vision 2030, at least in CFD, high order techniques. Okay? Because we need that for, uh, for accuracy. So message, in general, high order is going to be better. That's the academic message. Now, the crude reality. <laughs> Industry uses finite volumes. Okay? And we cannot forget that. Okay? So, um, what we do? We try to develop and do research in high order, but also work in finite volumes, because that's the need of the people we are working with. That's the need of the industry. Finite volumes are robust. They know that the accuracy is not the one that they would desire, but they know that they leave the computer overnight and they will get a result the day after. And that's important. Okay? So I'm going to talk by the end of the seminar on finite volumes a little bit. Okay, some old results, but I love to present them because um, th this is a, a pure convection, eh? a Gaussian and a, and a square, which value one here and zero on the other side. I love to present it because I was also, I was, this is after 50 revolutions and you can see that things were pretty good. Because when I was writing the book on finite elements, everybody was telling me, and I'm very conservative, I must say, that only low order elements were good for, uh, for convection problems. Okay? And it's not true. Okay? You can have also high order elements if you do things properly. Okay? This is done with uh, polynomials of degree something? Eight, here. Polynomials of degree eight. Okay. The mesh, as you can see, is quite coarse. And still, you are able to capture these sharp boundaries. Okay? So it's not true that you need to go to low order to solve problems. 
And the, the previous one was a very simple problem, a linear problem, pure convection. But you can move, that's the Euler equations. These are the Euler equations, uh, typical in, of interest for these continuous mm -hmm. working methods. You have to stabilize the convection here. This is a singular point uh, that generates a lot, lots of issues with entropy. And if you use large elements, high P, P equals to six, but you use artificial diffusion or shock capturing techniques, you are able to capture the exact uh, resolution and you can see how the shock develops in the middle of the elements and independently of the mesh orientation. So, we, are, we can use high order. And before, I just said that in general, high order is going to be better than low order. So why don't we do a step further? And that's the step further. Um, we want to solve Navier-Stokes. Here, we, it's a NACA, uh, it's a low, a low Reynolds number, this one. Eh? But uh, what we are doing here is adaptivity. This is P adaptivity, we are changing the value of the, uh, the polynomials, depending on an error indicator that I will be talking in a while. And as you can see, well, the, the order of the polynomials moves from two and can go as high as uh, eight uh, or seven in some times in order to be able to capture, in this case, the quantity of interest, the objective, was the lift and drag around the uh, NACA, Navier-Stokes. But also for, for Stokes, this is uh, slow motion, typical of uh, micro swimmers or, or uh, medicine type of problems. Uh, these shapes are perfect ellipsoids. You have to capture these shapes exactly. This is the mesh, so the mesh is quite coarse, but we have an indicator, we'll talk about it in a while, that allows us to know the value of the error in all these areas and therefore adapt our mesh. And for instance, in this area where of high velocities, the mesh is polynomials of degree three. In this area is where we move to polynomials of degree six, because we only have two elements to between those two inclusions, okay? So these are the types of problems that we want to solve and therefore be able to adapt our mesh to the, to the problems. And this is again Stokes problems. Uh, now, remember the finite volumes? Uh, this is done with finite volumes and, and I want to solve this problem and to be able to capture velocity and pressure, I can do it with higher P also. But the idea is in order to be able to capture all the drag and lift, which is quite complicated when you have several spheres, I want to, to be able to, to use uh, low order methods, adapt if I want, and so on, okay? Other types of problems that we are interested in, and let's link this to the model order reduction issues. This is the cavity flow that everybody knows. I've divided the velocity here by 10, but that's the cavity flow, Stokes, it's very simple. But now suddenly I want to add to this problem some jets on the corners. And those jets, the value of the amplitude of the velocity in those jets is going to be my parameter. So I don't know yet what is going to be the solution, but I want to solve this problem for any value of the velocity going from zero to 20. So orders of magnitude in which I will be moving is at least two orders of magnitude. And this is done with only six modes, six functions, space, times, parameters, six modes. Uh, and here you have the, 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 extreme, the extreme cases. Okay? Very small jet, a mid-sized uh, jet, and a very high jet at the end. The topology of the solution has changed a lot, uh, but with only six modes, we are able to, to capture, to capture this, this type of solution. Another PGD solution, this is Stokes flow, and this is a sort of NACA, where you are seeing how we change the four parameters. We have changed the cord, we have changed the width. Now we are changing the camber, and the camber has two parameters, one that puts it more to the back and more to the, to the front. 
And all of what you are getting here is the forces that the fluid does on the structure. And you are able to compute that exactly okay. uh, in, in real time. That's the advantage. Why? Because at the end we want to do things like this. These are an ACA defined with NURBS and we are changing the value of the parameters are now the, the control points of, of the NURB. And for micro swimmers, this is what we do. These are two mic micro swimmers in stoke flow, characterized by three parameters. These are two movies, eh? it's not the same movie. This, here you can see the velocities, and here you can see only the streamlines. We are changing three parameters which characterize the shapes of the nerves outside the, 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 the domain. Okay, and uh, this is, let me rerun it for you. And this is done in real time. Okay, so this is a capture of the screen. This is why it stops because you change the parameter and then he recomputes again all these sums of functions and products of functions and gives you and gives you the solution. The whole point is now you can put any oglenoid. All of these problems are very important because um, because of the clamp problem. Uh, we, we when we swim, uh, we advance in water thanks to the inertia. Okay. If you forget, if you do a steady state, uh, and we will not be advancing in swimming. Actually, this is what they call the, the clam problem. If you take a clam and the clam closes, it uh, expels the water and therefore it moves. Okay? But if it's in a Stokes flow, therefore no inertia and everything is reversible, when the clam opens again, she goes back to the initial position. Okay? And there is a proof that says that for one degree of freedom, okay, in a Stokes flow, you cannot find any periodic type of motion which allows you to advance. And we have some euglenoids, some little things uh, that are able to swim in Stokes. Okay? And to be able to characterize that, if to be able to do it, uh, engineers need and scientists need to, to reproduce all this motion and, um, and to reproduce it in periodics so they parameterize the motion of the little animal okay and they want to see if this swimmer is effective or not okay? and this is why we are trying to solve in Stokes type of problems uh, things that we characterize with a few parameters then you define a motion of these three parameters and you see if this thing, this something, is able to move forward or backward, okay? So that, that's the whole point. This is, I mean, it's not just for fun that we do it, okay? In any case, um, this problem has all the ingredients that I need. It's a reduce order problem where now what I'm changing is the geometry so remember when I said the affine dependence, the geometry means that every time I have to do an integral, my integral depends on the parameters. So I will need to do a mapping to take out the, the, the parameters out and integrate over a reference domain, find a mapping function, do the affine parameter separation. It's an, but, but it's in there, okay? So I need that. I also need to solve Stokes with a given precision because I don't need just the velocities, I also need the stresses on the surface, so I will need to have some precision to do that. So I will be using high order elements, to, or we try to use high order elements um, to do that. So parameters, fluids, and the fact that the geometry here is defined with NURBS. The geometry should be as exact as I can. Okay? So, yeah, I'm doing. I'm why don't somebody help me before I forget? Uh, I have to stop at uh, 10.30. Okay, that's okay. So somebody tells me at 10.30. Okay. You can also interrupt me anytime you want, eh, by the way. You know. well, anyway, so 10.30. When I teach, I usually have a, a student which I ask him or her to, 
to help me with the timings, because if not, uh, I can forget. Anyway, so, um, and, and the third ingredient is that I have NURBS. So let me talk very briefly on uh, the importance of capturing correctly the right geometry. That's something that we know in fluids for some time. This is Francesco Bassi and Stefano Ribey in 97. At the same time that Tim Barth was doing his thesis in Stanford, they, they discovered this. This is low Mach, uh, Mach 0.3, so low, low, low Mach uh, flows. Uh, and they realized that uh, independently of th the, the solution here should be symmetric. So this is the Mach number and it should be symmetric. This is a, a problem which is well known. A simple sphere, they refine and they keep on refining and keep on refining and keep on refining. Look at the mesh here and still the solution is not symmetric. And as soon as they changed the linear elements by quadratic elements, they said they obtained something which looked better. And they said, well, that's an advantage for high order methods. Yes, but, yes, but, okay? Same thing, Lesek Demkovic in electromagnetics, this is from this paper, using an exact geometry mapping, the error is reduced an order of magnitude with respect to isopatrometric finite elements. So, exact mapping, one order reduction with respect to isoparametric. Uh, but also in solids, this is uh, Mike Shepard and Jean-Francois Remacle. And let me go through this graphic. This is elasticity. Uh, this is the error. Here we increase the polynomial order. Okay. And Q is the polynomial of the geometry representation. So my boundary is characterized by linear elements, quadratic, cubic, and fourth order. Okay. Why is this important? Because in, if you go to work in, a, in industry, lots of people will tell you that, yes, yes, we know that linears in fluids and in solids can give you problems, but this is mostly fluid people because fluids are difficult, and, uh, but in solids, this doesn't happen, message number one. And message number two, as soon as you put second order elements, that's it. You capture the geometry almost exactly and you can forget all these issues of the geometry. Well, it, depending on the error that you want, we, we'll see that in a second. But the important thing is, look what happens, linear geometry and I begin increasing the order of the polynomials, my solution doesn't get better. If I have quadratic geometry, par parabolic functions for the boundary, uh, the error decreases, but then as I increase the polynomials, keeping the geometry as quadratic, the, the error decreases a little bit, but then again, it saturates very fast. And this happens for any example. So. Depending on how high order you want to go, depending on the accuracy that you want, be careful with the geometry because the geometry carries lots of information and the error of the geometry is what controls the saturation points. Okay? This is error due to the way you, you are not close to the exact geometry. And this is why we like to use, lots of people like to use, IGA people like to use NURBS, to capture the geometry because then you are with the exact one. Okay. Yes? Well, th these are the tough ones. I didn't cut the beginning. What happened when? Yes? Yes. Good. Uh, by p, order p equals to 2 here, I mean that I'm using polynomials of degree 2 for the functional approximation. So my test functions and trial functions are both polynomials of degree 2. But the geometry... What do you mean the discretization? See, yes, that, that's my 
my my my, uh, my approximation space is the, the no the domain is characterized by q q let let me maybe in a second let me, let me skip a few transparencies and i'll show you i'll show you one transparency that uh, will help you with this let me advance a little bit but one plot may be better than maybe this last one Here, the geometry is linear, and the approximation of the functions are linear. Here, I've changed in this element. This element here is yellow. That means degree 6. So I use in polynomials of degree 6 inside, and this boundary is a degree 6. This one is degree 5. So the, it's isoparametric. So I have polynomials of degree 5 here, and uh, polynomials of degree 5 for the boundary. But if I come here, uh, if I come here, here I have polynomials of degree 1 for the boundary and 1 for the approximation. But here I have polynomials of degree 1 for the boundary and different degrees inside of the elements. Okay? So this is q, which is 1, and p here if it's blue, it's 5. If it's orange, it's uh, 8. OK? That, that was the question? Good. So let me go back here. So th what the message was, this saturation point depends on the Q, OK? And it's not worth it to keep on increasing p because you will arrive always to a limit that you cannot go further. Okay? These are super parametric. Uh, no. Uh, ah, I always have issues with that. Um, super parametric or infraparametric? Uh, well, uh, finite elements can have an approximation function higher than the parameters that isoparametric is that ge geometry and the functions are equal. But in this case, we are using high order for the functions and lower order for the, for the geometry. Okay? Super parametric, I believe they are called. Yes? Knowing the authors, I don't think so. <laughs> they probably did some numerical evidence. Okay. Yes, the book of Raviar. You, go, you have to go to the French finite element people to, to know that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, this is important because when you have to capture small features in a mesh, you never know what to do. Okay. And that can take lots of time. The, the, what people doing meshes call defeaturing. Shall we take out all those small features? I, I remember once I had to compute uh, as part of a research project that was a part which was not research at all, but that phew, it was reality calling to us. Uh, a, a, a huge uh, outdoor bank for a park made of all of cast iron we received the CAD, and the CAD was a huge CAD, so we had to generate a finite element mesh. Objective, one hooligans get on top of these banks in the middle of a Christmas uh, market. Uh, we hope that the, the bench is not uh, breaking, okay? Uh, and we had to do some dynamic studies and so on. Anyway, when you receive the CAD, it's cast iron. So the company building this, this bench has its name written very small, in a small piece of the cast iron. Now, shall we take this name out or not? Is it important for the computation that we are going to do or not? In this case, it was obvious. You can delete it. But you need somebody sitting in front of the cat and taking out all these features, all, the, all those NURBS, in order to be able to generate a valid mesh afterwards. Okay? So this is the defeaturing. Is it influential or not? And the answer is, in heat problems, 
in heat problems, a small feature, you, we don't see the difference. In solid mechanics, in, in, uh, in standard mechanical problems, well, it depends. It depends. If, if you are interested in the maximum stress, of course, this little feature here will generate some singularities and there will be a change. But if you are interested in more global things, which are far away from this area, uh, this small feature will not have any influence. Okay? But you, you need to have the guy generating the mesh knowing if this is important or not, depending on what you are going to do afterwards. But there are problems like wave problems, where things get even more complicated. If you use long waves here, low frequencies, well, the small feature doesn't make any influence. But if you use high frequencies, short wavelengths, there is a big difference. This is, if, if you are doing what it's called radar cross-section. I'll show you some results in a while. Radar cross-section is what we use to know if it's a, a friend or a foe. Okay? It's a plane, it's an enemy plane or it's a plane of, of ours. Uh, so you, you send the radar, you look at the scatter signal that you received, and of course the, the scattering due to this small feature is very different than the scattering of a perfect uh, circle. Okay? So in this case, Small is very influential, and uh, it really depends on the frequency at which you will be working. So our, our approach to this, you can see here the, the radar cross-sections. This is the radar cross-section of this piece with the small feature. There is no difference at all. This is the radar cross-section with the feature and without it. So in just, this is the area where you throw the, the signal and you receive it. This is why you have more energy here, okay? But in this other period area, the difference between the two cases is very, very important, okay? And the machine should decide by just looking at this, what shape is the object, okay? So it's, 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 going, to be, it's going to be a problem if you don't put the small feature. Same thing here, this is an airplane, this is a small antenna in front of the airplane you have here. If you want to do it with finite elements, you have to remesh and have elements of the size of the small thing. If you use NURBS, you can use large elements, and that's what we do. And it's important because if you take out this feature, this is what happens. If you put it, you can see that the scattering is completely different in front of the, in front of the plane. And that makes a big difference in the way things are, are computed and, and measured, okay? But going back to the, to the flow problem, this is 64 elements describing the circle, 128 elements describing the circle, finite elements, even if you increase, you still, these are the results I showed you before, uh, you don't get the symmetric solution. As soon as you put a perfect, a perfect circle and a circle is a NURB, it's not a B-spline. A circle is a quotient of polynomials, if you want to, to, to capture it exactly. Uh, so if, if you put a circle, well, uh, even if you use 64, you begin to get much better, much better symmetry. And if you put uh, the 128, uh, you, you get the, the right uh, solution. This is done with linear elements. This is done with linear elements. Okay. Uh, this is, again, subsonic flow and linear elements. You can see that the reason for these changes of using the exact geometry or the approximated geometry is the entropy error. Uh, we are just solving Euler here, uh, compressible Navier-Stokes, but uh, uh, the, the, what, what makes the difference is the, is the entropy error between an uh, FEM and any FEM. And you can see it also for coarse mesh and fine mesh. This is finite elements. This is the nerves and hands. This is the plot of the entropy. This red thing should not exist. Okay? Everything should, should be dark blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a high area of entropy generation, which is smaller if you use the exact geometry, and even smaller so. 
it's not just a question of using high order approximation, functional approximations, it's also a question of having the correct boundary. Okay? As soon as you put the exact boundary, your entropy error decreases. And if we increase the order of approximations, what happens? If we go to P6, we get the perfect symmetric solution. So one thing is, is it's like the stability in, in, uh, in Navier-Stokes. You should not mix the stability that we need for the convection, for the stability, if you, want, if you don't use LBB elements, for the uh, incompressibility. Two parameters in your equations, okay? So here is something which is very similar. One thing is having the exact geometry, and even with low order elements, you can improve that. And of course, going back to what I said uh, a few minutes ago, if you increase the order of the approximations, the solutions are better, okay? And you converge faster. So P P6 here is going to capture the exact uh, geometry uh, with no problem, okay? So, just to finish with this, I, I'll try to finish this before break, and then we move to hybridizable discontinuous galerking. Let me go on with, with this geometry, and we are going to do it with, with HDG, with hybridizable discontinuous galerking. So I will be using some properties of HDG that we will see in a second. But you have here what we were talking a while. This is K is the P. This is the, approx the functional approximation. Q is the geometric one. Linear, linear. This is, I'm using second order polynomials, but linear approximation. Here are second order polynomials and parabolas here, quadratic approximations, okay? Here is cubic and parabolas for the geometry or cubic and linear for the geometry, okay? These are the typical things that we, that we want to check and, and verify. And HDG, you will see it in a while, HDG has an advantage, which is almost for free, you get an error estimator. Okay, and that's very, with a post-processing element by element, you have a hint of where the error is, and therefore you can decide very quickly if you have to increase, decrease your P. Okay? And that's what we do in this problem. So we take, this is a Stokes problem, analytical solution. Okay? It's an easy one. And um, what the only trick thing that we've done is that we have taken this boundary and we have cut it with a sign, okay? And we want to solve it exactly. Of course, we are doing the tricks. In the boundary, we can put the exact boundary conditions because we know the analytical solution. So you give me any boundary, I can put you on that boundary, the analytical, the analytical solution. So what we do is use linear elements for the geometry and we begin with linear elements for the geometry and the approximation and compute the solution. This, and we get an error indicator, which is here. And this error tells me, well, you are not at the target level. The, the, level, the target level is below, it's, it's here. So you have to refine. And it also tells you where you have to refine. And this is where you have to refine. And he tells you, look, in this area, you have to put polyno at least polynomials of degree five, the green. Uh, in this light blue, you have to put polynomials of degree four. Dark blue polynomials of degree two or three. And once you have that, with the same geometry, you recompute and you obtain a lower error. Good, things working, you know? I'm adapting and I obtain a lower error. Still not in the target, so thanks to the in indicator of HDG, I decide where to, how to change the order of my polynomials, and you see more green elements on the boundary, uh, well, but less dark blue in the back, but my, my error still decreases, and I go on, go on, go on, until I reach here for this linear boundary, I reach the target error with a given distribution of P's. That's it, we can go home, no? We finished. 
there is a problem. In this case, we know the exact solution. So we can compute the exact error. Okay? And sometimes it's better not to know, eh, not to have information, but you have to use it when you have it. And uh, this is the evolution of the exact error for those different cases. So, I don't know, we were on another world here, living in a different, uh, no, say in the zombie world. Uh, reality was up here, the error was not decreasing, and we were changing the piece and thinking that we were converging. And, and that's because HDG is wrong and the uh, estimator is wrong. No. Actually, HDG thought that we were smart enough and we were putting the exact geometry, but we didn't. Okay? So, if the exact geometry would have been those straight lines, that's okay, but the exact geometry was not there. And this is taking into account the exact geometry. Okay? So, that's not... Uh, it doesn't work. But, everybody that works in an engineering company tells me that with instead of linears, you put parabolic functions for the boundary, and that's high order enough. So, since I don't trust them, because I'm in the university, I'm going to play safe, and I'm going to use cubics for the geometry. So, what I'm putting here is, which, they look at able norm, they look very similar, no? I mean, this boundary and this boundary are almost the same. So cubics, I'm going to overkill the geometry and put cubics and do the same. So all of these are cubics uh, and I do the adaptivity. W why is important this to decide a priori if I want to use linear or cubics? Uh, <coughs> because I only use the CAD once. So I have my CAD and I say I want to generate my mesh. And the CAD asks me what type of geometry do you want? And I tell him piecewise linears for the boundary or piecewise cubics for the boundary. If I use, and I show you some results of isoparametric cases in a while, if I adapt and every time I do an iteration, I have to adapt my geometry, that means stopping everything, going to the CAD department, okay, and telling them I need another mesh. Okay, and they generate another mesh. They, in, in the companies, these are two worlds uh, separated and they build each other. Okay? So they will build you for the new mesh and you will go back and do the new computation. Okay? The advantage here is that I only use the cut people once. Okay? But I use cubics so that I don't need to call them anymore. And, uh, and that's what I get. I mean, it looks, again, Quite, uh, quite good, I get an estimator of the error here with my polynomials of degree three. This is the blue that I have here, the polynomials of degree th uh, the three. And I keep on iterating and obtaining, at the end, a distribution of p's, which goes as high as 11 in this element, but I r reach the target that I wanted. Again, I have the, 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 not the problem here that I know the exact solution, and this is the reality, okay? Uh, all the time doing the PR activity was a waste of time. Uh, that's, that's, that's a crude reality. Uh, instead, if, I, if instead of doing this, I, uh, I use the exact geometry from the beginning, so I use NURBS and HANS finite elements for the boundary, and I begin in iteration one with linear elements everywhere, uh, in three iterations, I am on the target. This is the final distribution of P. Most of P, most of the polynomials are degree four, the light blue. Some of them are degree three, <coughs> and the green are degree five. <coughs> so in three iterations, I get to the target, and I have plotted now both the estimated and the exact error distribution. So I'm doing what I, what I want. Okay. So that's the important thing of having the exact geometry. Yes? So in the third iteration, is the estimated error really lower than the exact error? Is the, yes, because uh, is in this case, the estimated is lower than the exact error, yes. It's an estimator, right? It's, it's not a... Actually, 
to be mathematically correct is not an estimate. It's an indicator of the error. Okay? It's, you, you can prove that it's bounded in the asymptotic limit, but we are not in the asymptotic limit, of course. Okay? It's, it, this is why we sometimes record about the strict bounds or, uh, or bounds. Uh, th this is uh, what the definition that most of the people use for estimator is that <coughs> you have an estimator if it is bounded in the asymptotic limit. Okay? But some others call that an indicator and not an estimator. Here it is computable. That's the, the big advantage. There is no C's in front of it which do not know the value. <coughs> anyway, it's a good indicator of what the error is. Okay? Uh, but sometimes it can be above. That, that, that's a problem too. Anyway, so you are able to do it. <coughs> and of course, uh, you could have done exactly the same thing with uh, you could have done exactly the same thing with isoparametrics, but at the cost of every iteration, I am changing the geometry on the boundary. I have to call the CAD department at every time in order to change my geometry. That's extremely expensive. That that's no sense. But even in that case, beginning with the exact geometry is better. Than, uh, than doing isoparametric. Okay? This is isoparametric, not isogeometric. Eh? Polynomials on the boundaries. With isogeometric, you would get a different solution. Let, let me show you an electrostatic problem. This is typical of electrostatics. Uh, <coughs> in electrostatics, in real engineering prob <coughs> backwards. In real engineering problems, <coughs> you don't have straight angles. You have rounded corners, okay? And of course, you can round it more or less or even less, okay? So usually you want to go as low as you can so that you can compute, but taking into account that it's not a perfect corner that is rounded. So even though you don't see it here, this is rounded, okay? And in real engineering problems, that's, that's actually more close to the reality than putting a, a straight angle, okay? So that, that's what we want to do. Uh, the problem is that if you do that, either you have to remesh a lot in H, or you don't know how to do the adaptivity, even if it's smooth, okay? Look at what happens if this is the angle that we want, the, the, the rounded corner that we want to put, these are the elements. This is the mesh, eh? so it's not a non-structured mesh, it's a standard mesh that you use. But here we have nerves that take into account this rounded uh, thing. And you can see here how we are estimating the error and the exact error in this case. How is it decreasing? In eight iterations we have converged. This is the final distribution of P that we need to capture the exact solution with this tolerance. And in this particular problem, of course, if your mesh is that big, if you don't do H refinement, if you only increase the values of P's, having a polynomial which is able to approximate very well this curved area here and then straight is not easy and isoparametric elements have problems and don't converge. Okay. So, let's close the geometry things. Uh, geometry is important in, uh, in real problems. Huh? We have this tendency of solving problems in very simple domains, which is good. This is where we have to check things, but reality is a little bit more sophisticated and having the right geometry is important. And don't trust those that tell you, because this is, uh, this is Poisson, actually. Electrostatics is the Poisson equation. Simpler than this, there is nothing. Okay? Um, it's not true that uh, these issues that the fluid people have found with the low geometry definition do not happen in solid mechanics or in Poisson. They do happen. So geometry is an important issue. 
And now we will see how to solve with uh, hybridizable discontinuous galerkin. So let's do the half an hour now, and we'll keep on uh, afterwards. Thank you. OK, so we've covered uh, all the issues. Now I'm going to concentrate a little bit more in um, fluids, but also elasticity, but mostly in fluids, and uh, hybridizable discontinuous galerkin. OK, that's the message. Um, Hybridizable discontinuous galerkin. It was developed mostly by Bernardo Cockburn, who is in Minnesota, and actually Jay Gopalakrishnan, uh, who is in Portland State. Uh, and, uh, and most of the applications, there are a lot of papers with Bernardo, Jaime Pereira, and, Co and Co, um, uh, on co convection diffusion, dif uh, all, all, all the equations. Okay, so. Of these references are the ones that you want to, to go through. These are the original references. Mm. We wrote for a course a tutorial uh, for the elliptic, which was oriented to help our graduate students. So there you have also a nice reference. And, and as all the others, all, all, I cannot do it with the other references, but all my references are on the web page that you had at the beginning of the on my web page, you can find them. You can go to the original uh, publisher's uh, document, but we also have the preprint, so you can always get information there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Stokes flow, which is easy, no? Stokes, no convection, so that's, this is the nice guy, uh, except for the fact that uh, there is the incompressibility issue, but uh, Apart from that, it looks like a linear, easy problem, okay? Uh, so these are the Stokes equations. Uh, and what we are going to do in order to use this continuous galerkin is following the idea of the domain decomposition, we are going to solve the equation element by element. So I haven't done anything else. I'm still in infinite dimensional spaces. I'm still looking for the analytical solution. This is still the strong uh, form of, uh, of the equations. And the only thing that I'm doing is, instead of putting omega, the whole domain here, I'm saying that if the previous equation was true in omega, it should be true in every subset of omega. Okay? That's the only thing that I'm saying. The, the equation should be true in every subset of omega. Of course, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions are also true in the corresponding boundaries. And for this problem to be equivalent to the previous one, I need to put what we call transmission conditions. Okay? Uh, transmission conditions, in the end, what it says is that the velocity, which is the primal unknown here, should be continuous from one element to the other. And stresses should be continuous. Okay? This expression, what it says is just that. But let me, because that's some, this, is a, this is a little detail that can be useful for all of you. All the old papers on discontinuous galerking are quite a nightmare with these definitions of the jump and the averages. And the definition we introduced now, Bernardo uses, everybody uses it, which is, Every time I write something like this, I need a normal vector inside. Okay? Right. Something times a normal vector. And the operator here, in this case, is the cross product. But if I have a scalar, this is going to be a vector, for instance. Okay? And these jumps are always equal to A on the left, on the right, one, two, call it as you want. A1 and 1 plus a2 and 2, or left and right. Put the names that you want. But it's simply this. The normals are unit normals and in opposite direction, so they take care, they always take care of the minus sign, of the jump sign. And that, and that if you code it like this, you are prone to orders of magnitude less bugs than if you call it some, 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 in some other manner, okay? 
If you have a scalar is like this, is if suddenly A is a vector, then you can do that. So the expression that you have here is the expression that you get. If here you have a scalar, you will get a scalar. If here you have a vector, you will get a vector. If here you have a tensor, you will get a tensor. The first papers from Bredzi and so on didn't, I mean, they had specific definitions of the jumps and they were changing the dimensions of the things that were inside. So this is why I decided to use this. In this case, for instance, this is a tensor, the stress tensor times the normal. So this is going to be a vector. So I have a zero vector here. Here, u cross n is a tensor, so zero is a tensor. Okay, and that helps me to 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 simplify my life. And I, the, the jump operator above and below is exactly the same, and it changes the functions inside to the same functions outside. Okay. In the previous papers, you would get the jump operator acting on a vector, giving a scalar, and acting on a tensor, giving a vector, and things like this, or the other way around. And uh, it was a little bit of a nightmare. So uh, this, and, and this is a little, it, it may sound redundant, but it's the most general thing. What we want is that the value of the velocity on the left and on the right are equal, OK? And since the sh boundary, the surface, may be oriented uh, in any direction, this ensures that we always ask for each component to be continuous on the left and on the right. Okay? So, first message, I haven't changed anything with respect to the classical way of writing Stokes equation. The only thing I've done is cut my domain in pieces and glue it thanks to the transmission conditions. The different elements are defined as usual, and I will have a gamma boundary, which is all the boundaries of the elements except the external boundary of the domain. So all the interior skeleton of my mesh. Okay? The problem hasn't changed at all. So first thing, I discretized element by element because I want to solve this is this continuous lurking. Second thing, I introduce the mixed variable. A mixed variable that's classical in continuum, in solid continuum mechanics, it has been used for centuries. What we do is we introduce, in this case, L, a tensor L, which is the gradient of U. This is what is done in L, the Bernardo Cogburn papers. So what they do is they introduce this L, and now where I had the gradient of U, now I put the L. Where I had the gradient of U, I put the L. Thanks to this, my equations, which were second order just here, are now first order. I only have first order derivatives. Okay? Good. Nothing else has changed. Okay? I have added one equation, and I have also the transmission condition. Everything else is, uh, is exactly the same. And one may think, we are getting crazy because what we are doing we are what we are doing is taking a problem which originally was in my domain and instead of using classical cg instead of using classical cg and having unknowns on the boundaries of these finite elements now i am duplicating the nodes on each LM, on each skeleton, on each edge. Okay, that's the first thing I'm doing. And I'm adding more unknowns, which are the derivatives of the velocity. Okay, I, I had the velocity, I had the pressure as unknown. Now I put more unknowns on the skeleton, and I put as an extra unknown the tensor, which is the derivative of the velocity. Okay, am I crazy or what is the question? No? And the answer is a little bit. But the whole trick of HDG is thanks to something which is called the hybrid unknown. Uh, in the book by Siarlet, a hybrid problem is a problem where we have as unknowns, not just the typical unknowns, but also the traces, the, the values of the unknowns on the boundary. 
If the values of the unknowns on the boundary are unknowns, this is a hybrid problem. That's the definition of hybrid problem. Okay? So what I'm going to do is, in each element, I'm taking the equations of the Stokes in each element. So I'm now just in element E. I don't know the boundary conditions. I'm going to invent them. I'm saying, imagine that I know the velocity on the boundary of each element. If I know the velocity on the boundary of each element, I can solve the Stokes problem like this. So for now, you had the hybrid unknown. You have this not known, but I suppose that I know it. If I have the right one, I'm able to solve this. OK? Uh, are you sure? Is this, imagine that I give you this problem, OK? Forget that it's on one element, in one domain. And uh, I'm solving the Stokes problem with Dirichlet boundary conditions on all the boundary. Does this problem has a unique solution? Can, I mean, am, am I able to solve it? I'm only prescribing velocity on the boundaries. I'm not prescribing any Neumann condition. Uh, the pressure is not yeah. Very good. That's the answer. OK, I know the, the solution <coughs> is known up to a constant on the pressure. So in fact, if you just discretize this, and I mean, that's the problem with Mat MATLAB. If you use the back slash of, Mat of MATLAB, it, it will give you an answer. But if you call a routine that somebody else has made, it will tell you, you your matrix is singular. And it's true, the matrix is singular because you can add any value to the pressure and you, it verifies the solution. You can see it here, the pressure always appears as a derivative, so P plus anything will also verify the equation. Okay, so the solution is not unique. Because if you have an incompressible problem with only Dirichlet boundary conditions, you know the solution up to a constant. Good. So we have to prescribe something on the boundary. Of now, go back to the DG. We have to prescribe something on the boundary of each element. Since we are thinking in uh, hybrid uh, D DG, what we are going to prescribe, instead of what we usually do is either the value in one point or the average of the pressure in the whole domain. What we do here is the average of the pressure in the boundary of the domain. Okay? And we will prescribe it to some value called rho E. We already said that you had was given by God, so we need God giving us rho E also, okay? But if they give us rho E, we are able to solve, well, we are able to solve the problem. So it's in fact unknown as you had was, but, uh, but if once we have it, uh, everything is okay. Another question. Is, is this true? C can I take any arbitrary value of rho E and an arbitrary value of you had, and then you can solve this problem. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm arbitrary. I'm inventing a value of you had, and I'm inventing a value of Roy. Random. I call random in MATLAB. And I try to solve the Stokes problem. Will I get a solution, a unique solution? Remember that we are solving an incompressible flow problem. Yes, are you sure? It's incompressible. So given the boundary, all the water that comes in should go out. So you had cannot be arbitrary, arbitrary. It must verify that the integral of the you had, f forget the, the Dirichlet boundary, eh? in any interior element, the integral of the you had should be equal to zero, the flux of water should be equal to zero. The same amount of water that comes through the boundary should go out on some part of the boundary, okay? So, something that looked very simple, it's getting a little bit more complicated, but still under control. We have solved the problem 
element by element. Somebody gives us a yuhat, we should make sure that the yuhat is, uh, is compatible, and we also need the value of ROI. But if we have those two things, we are able to solve this problem. And that's going to be very important, because if we are able to solve this problem, that means that we are able to obtain a solution for velocity, for the gradient of the velocity and for the pressure as a function of u hat and roi. And that's our objective. Let's try to find a function, the solutions as a function of u hat and roi and then go back to the transmission conditions, to the continuity between elements to determine u hat and roi. And that's what we are going to do. Okay, so this local problem is solved element by element. That's going to be cheap. I'm going to show you the equations in a second. This is fast. It's, in fact, a static condensation. Uh, in, in solid mechanics, there was a tradition to do static condensation. So when you have high order element, all the interior nodes have shape functions that go to zero on the boundary. So you can write them as a function of the boundary and only have boundary nodes. Okay, so this is what exactly what we are doing. We are taking out all the element nodes and all our unknowns at the end are going to be u hat and roi. Okay? So, well, I'm going to use the standard parentheses for the integrals in the domain, <coughs> these, these brackets for the, for the integrals on the surface and my approximation functions will be spaces in L2, they can be discontinuous element to element, okay, in L2, but in each element they are going to be polynomials of degree k. Okay, this is for the elements, this is for the skeleton of the mesh, edges in 2D, faces in 3D. Okay, but same polynomials, degree k in both places. And this, let, let me show you how we obtain the detail weak equations, okay? So we have the one that defines the mixed variable, the momentum equation, and the mass conservation. So I take this first equation here, and I, this is a tensor, so I have the test function is going to be a tensor. So I multiply by a tensor G, and I have the GL, that's okay. I'm doing the first equation. Eh? I'm multiplying by G, I have the GL, good. And I multiply this by G and integrate by parts, so G times gradient of that integrated by part is going to be the divergence of G times U and I will have the fluxes on the boundary. And the fluxes on the boundary are going to be the U hats because that's the value of U on the boundary. Okay. I'm already putting the U hats on the right hand side. Why? Because my objective is to obtain L and U as a function of U hat. Okay. Second equation, the momentum equation, this is a vector equation, so I multiply by a vector, w, and I integrate by parts. So I will obtain the gradient of w here. This is the L that comes here. This is the P that was there, since the gradient is now, we have the divergence of w, I have the, the pressure on its own. And of course, I have the stresses on the boundary, the stresses on the boundary, I put them here. I put a hat on top of them to make sure that I remember that these are on the boundaries and I will do a stabilization there. Okay? I will have to define this. The use, I don't need them because the use on the boundary, I know they must be equal to your hat. So I can replace them, but not for the stresses. I don't have any condition for the stresses yet. And for the conservation of mass, I do the same thing. This is a scalar equation, so I multiply by Q, integrate by parts, obtain the gradient here. I will obtain the velocities on the boundary. I know they are U-hats, and that's it. And to solve this element by element problem, I need to add my condition for the pressure. Good. So I have this. Uh, look that I've put here. I've put here the square root of nu and the square root of nu. This is only to maintain the symmetry of the discrete operator. The original Stokes problem was symmetric. There was no convection yet. It's not Navier-Stokes, it's Stokes. And 
in order to have the mixed problem also symmetric, I have to put this viscosity one in one side, one in the other. I'll show you the symmetry in a second. I first have to define the stresses hat, the stresses on the boundary. And how do I define them? F forget the first line. Look, look uh, the, the first line is only to, to, the, to particularize the case where you had on the Dirichle boundary is UD, that's it. Eh? So what I do is the stresses on the boundary are the stresses in the interior of the element plus a stabilization parameter tau u minus u hat. This is not the tau typical of SUPG or uh, stabilization techniques. This is the tau coming. All these techniques are descendants of Riemann solvers for pure convection problems. So this is the tau that you will find in a raw solver, in a Lax Frederick type of solver. Okay? They, they follow the same idea to, to, to set up this tau. Okay? But it's at the end, like in SUPG, a stabilization parameter. Uh, and we have to check if it's robust, it, it changes with the shape of the elements or not. Let me advance you, that it's very robust, actually. If you are solving a, <coughs> a problem of order uh, in dimensionless form, tau is of order one. So that, that's the analytical conclusion. Tau is of order one. You can put one, five, ten, you will get exactly the same results. Actually, you can put 100 and you will get the same results. The only thing that may change if you put 1,000 or 10,000 is that the condition of your matrix will suffer. But if you put order one, that's, that's fine. That, and that's a big advantage. You don't need, like we need when we do stabilization, formulas for the tau that depend on the shape and so on. Okay? In any case, once we have defined the fluxes, the stresses like this, we can plug them into the momentum equation and we integrate another time by parts. Why would we integrate by parts another time? In order to make sure that we have a symmetric term here and a symmetric term for the pressure here. Okay, but this is simple integrations. We know all of, there are lots of equations. Notation is difficult, but it's easy, easy to do it step by step. At the end of this, we have a problem <coughs> where we solve for the gradient of the velocity as a function of u hat and rho e, the velocity as a function of u hat and rho e, the pressure as a function of u hat and rho e. That's it. Okay? How is this matrix? It's like this. It's a, let's go back. It's a matrix which is symmetric, not, it's, not, it's indefinite. Okay, because it has the incompressibility thing inside, eh? the typical matrix which has eigenvalues positive and negative because of this zero. And this last equation that you have here is the condition that I have on the pressure on the boundary. Okay, is the condition that relates everything to rho e. So look, this is rho e equal to the average of the pressures. This is the fourth uh, column, is the one that multiplies the pressure. This is the, the equation that imposes the condition on the pressure, of course, with its La own Lagrange multiplier to have the same number of equations than unknowns. Okay? But as I said, if you forget to do that uh, and you suppress this equation, MATLAB realizes that this is a rectangular matrix and gives you also a solution. Anyway, well, so now we know how to solve the local problem. So now we know how to solve u, l, and p as functions of u hats and rho. What do we need to do? We need to add the fact that all these elements are, have to be glued together. The first equation is not needed. Why is not needed? Because every time we had a u on the boundary, we change it by u hat. And u hat is the same one for the left element that for the right element. So u is already continuous. Okay, weakly, but already continuous. Okay. So the only thing we have to impose is this equation here, the jumps. And the jumps are, if once we replace the values on the boundaries by the definition that we used before, is simply the sum for each element of these values. And if, since we go to each element, 
In one element we use the normal of the element, in the neighbor element the normal of the neighbor element is a minus, we will be computing the jumps every time. So the only thing we need to do is a loop on the elements and replace the value of this by the value on the boundary with all these expressions. At the end we get something, and of course with the corresponding test function, something where we have the L's, the P, the U and the U hat coming from there. But the L, the P and the U are functions of U hat and rho E. So at the end this is an equation with unknowns U hat and rho E. And how many equations do I have? As many as U hats. These are the test functions that live in the same space as the U hats. So this is as many equations as U hat, but I have U hat and rho e. How I determine the rho e? Don't forget the restriction that the U hat had to be incompressible. Okay? So this gives me a problem that looks like this. The first part are the unknowns for the, the are the equations associated with the U hats, which depend on U hat and rho e. This is why you have that. And this is the equation associated to this last one, which only depends on the U hats. The rho e's do not appear. Okay? And this should ring you a bell. This has the same structure as the classical Stokes equation. So again, an indefinite matrix. Okay? And therefore, we all should be afraid because LBB, LBB, LBB may, the, the, the ghost of LBB may be appearing any time here, no? Well, the beauty about HDG is that equal interpolation passes LBB. So no need to do any stabilization for the incompressibility. That's not bad. That's a beauty. Okay? So the unknowns, that is the first one. Second one. Unknowns are U hat and rho. We don't need to worry about LBB. Second thing, this is the typical mesh. The black dots is the interior part, is the interior elements. This is where we compute the L, the U and the P. These are the black dots where we compute L, U and P as a function of U hat, the red line, the red dots. Okay? We can change the polynomial here to the degree that we want. For instance, 10. And the polynomial along the red line will be of order 10. The polynomial for the pressure in the element will be of order 10. And the rho e. The rho e is a scalar. It's the average of the pressure on the boundary. <coughs> so, in this global problem, as we increase the order of the polynomials, the u hat is going to increase, but the rho e, no. The rho e is only one unknown per element. So we get the precision of order 10 for the pressure, <coughs> and our problem here still has only, as unknowns, the number of elements of the, of the mesh. Okay. So that's another big advantage of this approach. Okay. Good. So we are able, well, we were initially mad because we were increasing a lot the number of unknowns, the interior, the hybrid, but at the end of the day the, the costly problem is done only on the skeleton and for less degrees of freedom of pressure than we thought originally that we needed. But on top of it, we have the superconvergence property. Uh, let me go back to this equation. This equation is a kinematic equation which relates the gradients of U to L. Okay? So I'm, what I could do is I could uh, take the divergence of this equation. What, why do I want to do that? Maybe I should have said because this should have said that a little bit earlier. When I solve this problem, when I solve this problem, and I compute the errors, the analytical errors, the exact error bounds, 
how, what is the rate of convergence of U, of P, and of L, which are my unknowns, and of U hat? The answer is always the P plus one, K plus one, the order of the approximation plus one. For the velocity, is reasonable. For the pressure, it's reasonable because we are using the same approximation that for the U. This is what we would expect in classical finite elements. But for L, L is related to the stresses, that's not standard. And the reason is that we have used this hybrid variable and that the L, we solve it in the local problem as we solve for the U's and the P's. And we use polynomials of degree K for the L too. So the local problem that we are solving in here treats the L exactly the same as the U, exactly the same as the P. All equally interpolated. When I was writing, no, the other way around. When I was writing the spaces here, I said I only work with spaces in the elements, all of polynomials of degree K. You have the K here. When I write the weak form here, when I write the weak form here, I say I want to look for L, U, and P, and L is matrices of these spaces. U are vectors of these spaces, and P is a scalar of these spaces. So all of them are polynomials of degree K. All of them have the right boundary conditions. How they should converge as K plus one. So this method just straight away gives me a matrix which has the same structure as Stokes, allows me to have less degrees of freedom for the pressure, and I get a higher approximation of the stresses than what I would get on a standard finite element. Okay. No, yes, and I'm going on the right direction, yes. And on top of it, since I have now stresses that I know and they converge as k plus one, this is the divergence of the equation L equals to minus grad of u. So what I can do is I can take the divergence of that equation, like this, put the natural boundary conditions, like this, and I know that L converges like k plus one. So what I'm going to do is to solve this equation not for use with k plus one in a polynomial of degree k, because that's, I already did it, but I'm going to solve for u in a larger space, in a space of polynomials of k plus one at least. k plus one is enough. This converges with k plus one. This, I use polynomials of k plus one. I solve this problem element by element, and I obtain a solution U superconvergent, which converges as k plus two. So with a loop on elements where I have to solve a simple diffusion equation, no, not, no, not pressure here, no, this is a simple diffusion operator. Okay? I can get an approximation of the velocity, which is one order higher than the one expected. Okay? So I get U, L and P as k plus one, and U, if I want, I can get it as k, as k plus two. And this is what I'm going to use for my error estimator, because now I have in each element an approximation of U, which I know converges, let me call it UH, in each element, minus the u exact. This, I know, converges as order k plus one. I have a u superconvergent that co is converges as the order of h k plus two. So, u minus u h minus u superconvergent, this norm, is a good approximation of this error. And that I can do it element by element. Okay. And this approximation of the error, if I use Richardson extrapolation, tells me 
recursion isolation in order to know which is the error that you desire, it tells me which is the P that I have to put to do the adaptivity. Okay. So I have a formulation which is first order because I'm exploiting the mixed variable local element by element formulation as in classical DG, equal order interpolation for all the variables. My global solve is in a domain of dimension number of spatial dimension minus one. I have high accuracy because I get k plus one on all the variables and I have a local post process that gives me k plus two. And look at the stencils that I have. This is CG. I don't know if you see the darker nodes. This is for this node, which is the stencil in CG. This node talks to all these other nodes. We agree, no? In CG, that's what happens. This equation will be linked to all these nodes here. This node here doesn't talk to these ones, for instance. Okay? So if you have to compute which is the bandwidth of your matrix, you, take, you know that this node is going to talk to this one and these are going to be the non-zero elements in the stiffness matrix. Okay? In CG, it's very similar, but, but in each vertex, instead of having one unknown, we have now six in this problem because we have six edges arriving, so more equations. Okay? We have to pay for that. But it's very similar. But what happens with vertex nodes, the vertex nodes in CG? The vertex nodes in CG is talking to all these bold-faced elements here. And this is a structured mesh. But in a non-structured mesh, that changes for each vertex. And be, can be longer and smaller and longer and smaller. OK? This is the trick. The people that compared HDG to CG was using to say that in runtime, HDG was faster than CG. Because in runtime, this is very important. This is the structure of the matrix. This represents the non-zero elements when you do the decomposition of the matrix that you have to, to store in your matrix. It has a large influence. Note that in HDG, we have more degrees of freedom, but the stencil hasn't changed for a vertex node. Okay? And this is just to give you a comparison. This is the, mat this is the size of the standard DG matrix that we'll give you. This is the standard DG matrix with all the interior nodes. Backwards. This is the size and the structure of HDG. The blue line and the red line is vertex node in red, uh, edge node in, uh, in blue. And this is the equivalent of CG. It's a smaller. We have, this is the case in 2D. Eh? We have six m less vertex nodes. Eh? As you increase P, this difference is getting smaller and smaller. But look at the difference between the structure of the matrix, edge node, vertex node. Mm -hmm. And that, for the solvability of the problem, makes a, makes a big difference. And this is why people use HDG. And I could go home, and, I, and that's it. I mean, and you would know exactly what uh, people were using HDG up to very recent. There is a little problem, and those of you who f have followed my book will understand very quickly. Um, well, mathematicians have this tendency to work with this equation instead of the real one. In the real one, we have the divergence of the stresses, and the stresses include the symmetric part, uh, the symmetrized part of the gradient, the deformations. Okay? And you can say, yes, Antonio, but I mean, they are equivalent because we know that if we take the divergence of this, uh, which is what we are doing when we replace sigma in this equation, we will have something that has the divergence of u. The divergence of u is equal to zero, so is the, they are equivalent. And the answer is yes. <coughs> they are point-wise equivalent. In the weak forms, that's not true anymore. But, but let, I, I buy it. They are equivalent. Okay, 
but you will agree with me that what is clearly not equivalent is the stresses. What we call the external forces here, they, these are not the same ones that we have there. Okay, we are missing the symmetrized part in this equation. And the whole HDG is based on these transmission conditions which ask for the symmetry between the stress tensor. Okay? So this is not true anymore unless we add this term which is missing on uh, the velocity pressure classical uh, formulation. Okay. And this, this, this has been a problem in the in this lay last uh, five six years for people in, in our field because because uh, you could say well look I mean in most of the codes in fact we don't write this what we write is this every time we need to put the gradient of u we put next to it the the transpose, and that's it. And we compute with this, and, uh, and um, with this we can have the local problem as before, and the global problem, and that's it, and we are finished. And uh, in fact, we are verifying the conservation of mass, we are doing it element-wise, and, uh, and thanks to this compatibility condition element by element, so we are doing it point-wise and element by element, we are also conserving the linear momentum, both, again, because we use these equations and we use the continuity between the elements. We are also conserving the angular momentum, the symmetry of the, stre of the Cauchy strength tensor, because point-wise point we are adding this. But if you use this formulation, that's not something that I'm saying myself, Bernardo Cockburn and the others, already published that in 2010, uh, you lose optimal convergence in the stress. Oops. As soon as you want to use this formulation in real engineering problems, the stresses are not K plus one anymore. If you use the other, I, I was not lying when I was saying that if you use the VP formulation, things converge and L was converging as K plus one, okay? That's true, but if you add the L transpose, then you don't converge as K with K plus one anymore. For K1 and K2. For K3, magically things become better, and K4 and K5, and everything converges perfectly, but not for, but not for K1. And this is due to the fact that we are using a mixed formulation. Are you familiar with mixed formulations in finite elements? A little bit. Mixed formulations is what I just did, which is uh, to use as, a, as an unknown the derivative of the primal unknown. So that, that's typical, for instance, Huashisu formulations for soil mechanicians, Heilinger, Riesler, no, okay. If you do what I just did, which is use as unknowns the velocity and the derivative of the velocity, this is a mixed formulation. If you decide in, in solid mechanics to use as unknowns displacements and deformations, this is a mixed formulation. Okay? And mixed formulations have been um, lovers for mathematicians. Eh? I mean, uh, they, plenty of people working on, on, on mixed formulations in mathematics. Uh, they, had the, uh, they have the advantage that uh, apart, I mean, you, you have the velocity and the, or, or the displacement and the fluxes or the stresses because you have added and, um, and you approximate directly the stresses or the, or the fluxes w as we did. And therefore, to evaluate quantities of interest is much better because you already have the derivatives of the velocity as an unknown and you approximate it better. So in that sense, it's much better. They have the difficulty that you have to be LBB stable, UX. Or, if you don't understand, don't worry, but I will just give you the concept. Or, that you have to be HDIV. If sigma is an unknown, you have to make sure 
that sigma lives in a special space. Okay? Let's call it that way. And you also have to make sure if sigma is an unknown that sigma is equal to is symmetric, that sigma is transpose. Okay? I'm doing it with sigma because that's probably what you think, but I could do exactly the same thing with the deformation. The deformation should live in a space which mathematicians we like to call them HDIF, and uh, the deformations is a tensor which we know is symmetric, so we have to input. So if we decide that deformation is an unknown, we have to make sure that it's a symmetric tensor. Okay? And there are three alternatives to solve this problem. The alternative number one, which was originally developed a few kilometers from here in Liège by uh, Professor Freis de Verbeck. Freis de Verbeck and Zinkiewicz, Zinkiewicz you probably have heard of, Freis de Verbeck probably not, uh, both were people working at the same time and developing finite elements together. Freis de Verbeck, the unknowns were uh, uh, the stresses, because he was using a mixed formulation. Zinkiewicz, the unknowns were the displacements. Okay? Simpler Zinkiewicz, more difficult Freis de Verbeck. And Freis de Verbeck died very young. So that didn't help either that approach to, to be very successful. But that's, it has been used and it's used recently and you can see mostly mathematicians doing it. In this case, we decide to verify this space strongly, but the symmetry, we don't do it uh, as a strongly. There is a, an option too, um, just to remember names, Lezek Demkovic and Jacob Alakrishnan are here. DPG is here. Okay, that's the DPG approach. Okay, HDG, what I'm going to present you, is also living in here. The symmetry is imposed strongly, and the divergence is element by element, but not on the boundaries. Okay, we cannot impose this HD thing on the boundary. But that is a better approach, which is Arnold and Winter elements. Uh, these are the Arnold and Winter elements. Just for you to remember. The lowest order element has 24 degrees of freedom for the stresses and 6 degrees of into the eh, for the displacements. And no high order elements have been developed. E a little bit too difficult for me. Uh, there are other alternatives. As soon as the people in HDG, up, up from that paper in 2010, realized that something was wrong with the formulation for stresses and low order elements, there were different alternatives. The M decomposition, that's the work of Bernardo. Some others use an alternative HDG formulations. Alexandre Erna and uh, Di Pietro were advocating for the high order. I have a problem with all of this. I'm limited. My, 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 my programming skills are very limited. So as soon as I have very sophisticated elements, I have issues, OK? And everything becomes a mess. So I, I love things which are extremely simple. Uh, and therefore, my question is, can we devise a mixed formulation with strong energy of the stress tensor and at the same time to have the superconvergence of HDG for equal order approximation, and at the same time it, to rely only on nodal unknowns without the enrichment and without doing anything strange. The Harrell winter element, the unknowns are vectors on the boundary, like the Cruzier Raviar elements. <sighs> That's too difficult. My skills of programming are very limited. And the answer is yes, but for that you have to go to another guy who always was choosing the simplest solution, which is Ted Belichko. Uh, people that have been working on solid mechanics knows that when you com code a code in solid mechanics, you use something that is called void notation. Okay? Void was a German professor called Valdemar, like Voldemort, hmm? but uh, Valdemar. And he used, the, and he used this notation. Uh, which is a notation which imposes the symmetry. Okay? In, in fact, we say that the stress is written in 2D. Let's see it only in 2D. We have only three components of the stresses and three components of the strains. And we code everything like this. 
and they use this notation to simplify the, 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 the finite element codes. Okay? This is in their book, a uh, first course in finite element, that's, that's where you can find it. For instance, this is the, strength, the, the, the strain rate transfer in our case because you are velocities, but you have here in terms of the three, of the three things. Now, since I want to work with a vector, I need a matrix here, which is this one, which is able to transform the two component vector into a three component vector, which is this one, it's transpose, okay? And um, for the constitutive equation, here I had the identity. Well, now the identity is, is a vector like this one because it has to transform a scalar into a vector. And the viscosity, which was a number that multiplied, well, now it's a matrix, but it's again, it's a diagonal matrix, very simple, okay? So I have to rewrite all those things, but by simply studying a little bit of notation, I can rewrite my real problem with the symmetry gradient into something which has exactly the same structure, but instead of having the S above, it's below. Let's put it this way, okay? Uh, so it's matrix and so on, but I, I, I can use it and use this, this, this void notation. I have all obviously to, to rewrite the, the Gauss theorem and the Stokes theorem, okay? But these are things that we know. The divergence of a function should be you know, integration by parts, that's the Gauss theorem. This is the, 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 the Stokes theorem, the rotational of a vector is all the tangent multiplied by the multiplied by the vector on the boundary so all of this all of this is well known and, and they reproduce in this notation and therefore I can use these expressions to rewrite my HDG code that's easy to obtain the weak forms I need this and I use it no problem and then I can go back to my superconvergence. And in my superconvergence, I rewrite now the same thing. This is, the remember, it was the divergence of square root of nu uh, gradient of u. Well, now with the s's, but it's the same thing. Same expressions. <coughs> and since I only have Neumann boundary conditions as before, I need to do as before this <coughs> standard number of special dimension conditions. But in my, now they are not enough. Why? Because I only controlling here <coughs> the symmetric part of the tensor, not the whole tensor. Before it was L, the whole tensor. <coughs> now I'm controlling only the symmetric part. That was the problem that they found in that paper in 2010. But if I use the Stokes theorem to impose that the rotational of the u is equal to the circulation of u hat, I obtain a new condition, just the conditions that I need to solve this problem. And using void notation plus this, I can reproduce again all the advantages that we had before. Equal to an approximation on all the variables, we can have k plus 1 for all the values of k, larger of, of, of 0, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Let me show you some examples. Uh, this is a Stokes. This is this paper that just came out, eh? just directly from that paper. So you have hexes, tets, prisms. As soon as you want to do an unstructured mesh, you, you, you may need to use these elements for the boundary layers. And pyramids. Pyramids is a square and a node on top of it, okay? Uh, if, you want, if you need to do real measures for real problems, sometimes you have to do things like that. And here you have for quads, uh, for quadrilaterals and triangles, so 2D and 3D, hexes and tets, prisms and pyramids. And you have, for instance, P and L, P and L, P and L. And you obtain for P and L the optimal rates of convergence. So if, if it's k1, then you have to, must have k plus 1, so you get 1.9. If k is 2, you have 2.8. If k is 3, 3.9. So you obtain for k and for p the optimal rate of convergence. 
for all the elements. And if you now look at the velocities, u and u star, u star is the superconvergent one. For k equals 1, you get the k plus 1, the 2. And for u, the u star, you get the 3, which is parallel to the next continuous one. Okay? So you always get k plus 1 for the interior velocity and k plus 2 for the uh, superconvergent one in all the cases. So now I have a method that works that gives me some information on the error and I can do the adaptivity that I just show you of the adaptive Navier-Stokes problem uh, element by element in which I'm guessing the p from order k equals to 1 to as high as I want. Okay? This is a problem where we know the analytical solution and this is why you can see that we can very quickly obtain the analytical solution and again the higher the number, the higher the k, the, the faster we get there. All of this that I've just explained is also true for elasticity. Remember the 24 uh, sigma degrees of freedom of sigmas and the 6 for this? This is the equivalent in HDG. Nothing than 24 degrees of, uh, unknown, degrees of freedom unknowns of the Arnold Winter element. And some of them are fluxes normal to the edge of the element. So all of this is extremely simple. E again, equal interpolation for everything. You see that K1, U and L converge with the slope that you want. Uh, K2 with the slope which is K plus 1. K3 with the slope that, that you wanted. And of course the superconvergence. So K plus 2, K plus 2, K plus 2. Okay. And you can say, well, but in, um, in elasticity, uh, things work nicely when things are compressible, but as soon as you end up working in incompressible problems, you may have things that they call locking and, uh, and, and strange behaviors like these ones. Okay? Well, this is what happens when you increase the Poisson ratio and you make it close to 0 0.5. Nothing changes. You still converge. So you end up having a formulation which is locking free in the solid mechanics environment. Okay? Why? Because we come from incompressible fluids. We know that we pass LBB. We have checked all of those things. Okay? And we know that all of this works. So it's locking free. Good. Uh, and we can also go to k equals zero. Okay? I was telling you at the beginning that industry has, has this love for finite volumes. Okay? So let's go down to k equals zero with HDG and see what happens. Um, all the commercial codes that you probably have heard, open, foam, fluent, are cell-centered. There are some which are vertex-centered. ANSYS code is vertex-centered. Uh, uh, vertex All these codes are... Ex any of you has experience with uh, open foam? You. And the meshes that you used were always nice meshes or, no, very strange meshes, okay? And um, I don't know if you ever try to solve a problem with strange meshes and an analytical solution that you could look at the rate of convergence. You didn't do that. Well, if you, if you play with it, you will see that if the mesh is structured and good, you get the, you're using k equals zero, okay? So you should expect order one in the approximations, okay? And you get order one. But as soon as you use the real meshes that, for instance, close to here, who uses uh, open foam on a daily basis? Volkswagen, eh? Vol the Vol Volkswagen uh, research, which is the research not just for Volkswagen, but for all the group for uh, Skoda, for uh, Audi, and so on. Uh, Volkswagen Research uses open phone on a daily basis. And their meshes, they have to refine them. If they do CFD close to the, to the body of the car, if they do mechanical problems, they also have to refine things. But uh, they have to refine. And if they refine, they are not as structured anymore. Okay? And then the orders of convergence 
are not the same ones. Same thing with ANSYS. ANSYS does a very sophisticated reconstruction in order to, because what happens with the stresses in a finite element, in a finite volume code? Displacements, convergence, converge with k plus one. That's nice, order one. So you refine and the error decreases as h. But, and the stresses, the stresses as a standard in any finite element code or a DG code, they converge with k. That's k which is zero. So stresses do not converge if you refine, unless, and that's what finite volume people call reconstruction. Reconstruction is a very engineer word to say, we interpolate. Okay. So the, if the mesh is nice, the interpolation is, is easy because you go one element after uh, and then you, re, uh, you reconstruct, you interpolate a polynomial of degree one for the stresses and you obtain order one for the stresses. Okay. The, this reconstruction in fluent, is, in ANSYS, sorry, is quite sophisticated. So if you think of what we just did, we were able to work with K1. Can we work with K0? The answer is yes. And if we work with K0, displacements, velocities will converge with order one, but L yeah, will also converge with order one in a natural way. And I don't need the reconstruction. Okay? And this is why we, we, uh, we, we decided, even though you have much more faces than nodes and then elements, okay? Uh, it was worth it to try to see if this method was good because it doesn't have reconstruction, it has linear conversions for stresses and is LBB compliant. There's something else that you don't have to worry. In, in uh, open foam, the algorithm is the old algorithm that uh, Marek and I did use already in our thesis, which is the fractional step call it that way, but it's the old algorithm in which you correct the pressure with a Poisson thing and so on, um, because they, they, they may have to make sure that they pass LBB. We don't have this issue. Uh, and this is the potential flow around a full aircraft. Uh, we are talking five million TEDs, 11 degrees of freedom. This is solved in one of these small laptops in nothing, in uh, six minutes, I mean, nothing. That, the accuracy is awful, okay? Don't try to do LES with this, okay? But it gives you something, okay? Th this is why industry loves finite volumes, okay? Uh, same things with the Stokes flow. You can also do with the K0 and get to the exact value. Of course, if I show you here <coughs> the high order, the high order reaches convergence there. Okay, but here with 17 uh, million degrees of freedom, two and a half million TEDs, I can assemble in 10 minutes, uh, uh, sorry, uh, construct the elemental matrices in 10 minutes, assemble in three minutes and solve for five hours because the problem is very big. I'm using MATLAB to do that and I get a solution. Okay. It's very difficult to do this with a code that doesn't, um, I mean, in real problems, uh, you, don't, you are not as robust. And you can also do it in solids. This is a funny example. I use this one because this is the prop, this, it's very old, eh? Nine, the solution is analytical solution by Timochenko in the book, 1959, okay? Uh, this is a shell, clamp it on both ends, and you increase the pressure in the interior. Okay. and it has an analytical solution. This problem was shown in the first IGA paper because they said in order to solve this type of problems, IGA is very useful and it's true because IGA for shell elements et al, it's, is extremely useful. And we wanted to use this to test also constant element by element solutions. Okay? Uh, the whole trick in this problem is that you should be able to to capture this sort of boundary layer, since the cylinder is clamped <coughs> and you increase the density, there is a sort of boundary layer in the shell that generates next to the, next to the clamping, okay? Next to the boundary condition. 
and this is what we get. Of course, with a coarse mesh, which is the, the, the first one, the, the black one, you, get, you don't get the exact solution, but it's 80 elements in one direction, 10 in the other, and two in the thickness. But as you refine, you don't need to refine the thickness. You do not need to refine the thickness. You get, you converge to the exact solution. Okay. That was something that we wanted to, to, to check with um, all these uh, solid mechanics also, and it worked. And let me show you what really impresses the people using open foam and, and fluent. Uh, now I can perturb. This is taken, uh, we can do it in 3D also, right? but the, in 3D seeing this is a little bit of a nightmare. But in 2D you realize very well that we have put a random displacement around a regular mesh of size h and size h divided by 4. For triangles, the same thing. <coughs> and um, as you can see, some of these shapes are quite uh, extreme. Okay? And uh, some of the quadrilaterals look more than tri a triangle than a, than a quadrilateral. And in, any, in both cases, you don't lose the order of convergence. <coughs> okay. That's something that people working on finite volumes appreciates, appreciates a lot. Of course, just to make it a little bit more difficult, we are also doing it in the incompressible case for solids. Uh, but in fluids, what are we are interested is in the boundary layers. And the stretching is also, remember, we are approximating the functions as constants in every element. Okay? <coughs> So this stretching <coughs> also is something that finite volumes don't like very much. And you can see here that we have gone up to stretching ratios of 1,000 and the convergence rates are the, are the correct ones, okay? So for all the quads and so on. So it seems that these techniques are <coughs> working properly in order to be able to to solve this problem. And all of this, we are using it, and now I'm recapping some of the stuff that we have been seeing. Remember, our purpose was to do reduce order mo uh, modeling and PGD for solving this problem, and this is why I began explaining you all the PGD, okay? <coughs> we want to solve flow problems, parametric flow problems, <coughs> and to solve those parametric flow problems, <coughs> I told you, we better not use a formulation which is too intrusive. Let's use the same parametric functions for the velocity, all the components of the velocity and the pressure. Remember I told you that? And that's important because I don't want to be intrusive. That's crucial if I want to use commercial codes. And if I use HDG for high order and adaptivity, things work. Now let me show you. This is the work of a PhD student, an industrial PhD student, which is working in, in Volkswagen. This is why we know it. And um, about this is the solution obtained with open foam in Volkswagen for the cavity problem. As you change the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number, that is the velocity on the top, is the parameter here. So we have solved this. We only need three modes, three modes to get the solution, and for a range of lower, low, medium values of the Reynolds number, we are able to capture all the, all the different things and get an explicit, remember, eh, this is an explicit parametric solution. We don't need to solve anything else to get. And this is what we use, remember that problem? The cavity with the jets, okay? This is exactly what we use to solve this problem. Again, six modes, as I told you before. Six modes, which for each, every time you compute a mode, you have to solve a sort of HDG problem in space. For the functions in X, it's similar to solving a direct problem, okay? A full order problem. Um, so how computing six modes, and this is an iterative process, that means solving lots of HDG problems. The answer is 
this problem had a cost of solving three times the same problem for three values of the parameter. Okay? And we were able to solve it for that range of velocities which was changing two orders of magnitude. Okay? The jet velocity was either 0.1 as the top velocity or 20. Okay? So uh, we are changing the jet three orders of magnitude. We are able to get a solution for all the range of those jet velocities in three orders of magnitude. And the cost is like solving the problem for three values of the jet. And the funny thing is that if we have just in computed for three values of the jet and interpolated the solutions, you will agree with me that all these topological changes would not have been captured. Okay. And that's the whole trick of being able to mix all of this. Okay. I just show you the low order problems where we are right now working on the high order approximation for this. Okay. So, you see, I finished a little bit earlier so that you can ask questions. Um, I hope to have convinced you that high order approximation and therefore larger elements can be employed for convection dominated problems. HDG is a reasonable alternative for, H for high order approximations. The extra unknowns with this hybrid approach are uh, decreased. You still have more unknowns because you repeat nodes on the vertices, but the structure of the matrix allows you to compute much more faster. I didn't want to get into all the implementation details, but if you have a mesh in HDG, there are things which are extremely easy to to, to, to see even if the mesh is non-structured. Even if the mesh is non-structured, one edge in 2D, same thing is going to happen in 3D. One edge sees himself and one, two, three, four more edges. And that's it. And that's it. So you have full matrices, one per edge, but they are only five elements, five blocks which are non-zero. This, the new supercomputers, the new nodes that you use in any parallel machine loves it because they love these block matrices to work with and not very big and with a structure which is repeated const continuously. Okay. That's not the case of CG, where every vertex node you don't know until you have the mesh to how many nodes it is connected. Okay. So this is why I, we believe HDG is a reasonable alternative for high order approximations. As soon as you put the void notation, which is the natural thing and that is already written in books, uh, things come out quite, uh, quite naturally and, 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 and you can solve the problem easily. That's, that's the big advantage. And you can run from K1 to K20 and therefore your adaptivity will work. Exact boundary representation, I spent some time telling you that exact boundary representation is important. And don't trust practitioners that tell you parabolas on the boundary are good enough for uh, real problems. That's not true. Uh, the parametrized solutions, and we use PGD, but reduced basis is an excellent alternative. POD, there are plenty of alternatives which are very reasonable. In our case, we use PGD, and we can obtain it with high order approximation and exact boundary representation, which is important for us. Thanks to the way we do it, we have little advantages. When, when I talk with uh, Gianluigi Rozza, no? when he does uh, incompressible flows, he has to make sure that uh, in the online phase where they compute the coefficients that multiply the basis, they have to make sure to pass LBB. And therefore, they, they, they need to do some mathematical tricks to do that. We, we, we avoid all of this from the beginning. Okay? That's, that's an advantage. Uh, at least we see it as a, 
uh, as an advantage. Eh? Uh, we are able, and that's very important for industry, to obtain parameterized solutions with non-intrusive and low-order methods, which is what they understand. On the site, we use their money to do the high-order ones, okay? But uh, we'll tell them afterwards when it's everything is finished, okay? And, um, and we were able, um, do developing all of this, to, to create a new finite volume method, which industry likes it very much because uh, it's orders of magnitude less sensitive to the, to the mesh, and it has built in the reconstruction and the LBB properties. So I hope this was interesting for you, and if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer. Well, I got questions in the first part. They are probably a little bit tired by now, but uh, but I'm here. Okay, so if you need any, have any questions, I will be there. Oh, Nico. The, the link between H <coughs> Oh, uh, yes, I'll try to do that. Um, every time, in, when I have to solve for a PGD problem, let me go back to the PGD part of the presentation. As soon as I say here, for instance, I didn't write it in detail, but as soon as I say they, that my unknown is written like this, okay, what I will do is I will plug, and I, I use a greedy, I didn't want to get into it because it's quite heavy. I use a greedy algorithm, so I only compute the last term, and I put this into the weak form which is associated with that problem. And I split my problem. I have a, one problem in X, this is why I need the affine decomposition of the, of the weak forms here, I have a problem in X and a problem in mu. The problem in X is a standard finite element problem, we weighted. The, the viscosity is not the viscosity because it's influenced by some integrals of these functions, but from a resolution point of view, is similar to any standard finite element solved in space. And there, you use your preferred technique. You want to use finite differences, you use finite volumes. We use HTG. So we use HTG to solve this problem. Here is where you have the convection diffusion. Here is where you have the pressure, uh, in, the incompressibility, and, and the possible instabilities due to the in incompressibility. This is a very simple problem. Actually, lots of people, this, for instance, the, the the Parisian school, the, the people in Paris, they don't even write it in weak form, the problem for mu. I, I like it because this allows me to get some error bounds, and if I do some error estimation, I can do the error estimation and so on. But this, if you use collocation for this problem, you are actually solve it at each value of mu. The problem only for the for these for these functions. Okay. And of course, I, I do, but in mu, I have a very simple 1D, because since I separated the mu, it's a very simple finite element problem, which doesn't have all the standard difficulties that we are confronted in uh, systems of equations, convection, diffusion, incompressibility, the non-linearities, everything. All the bad things are in here. This is nice, this is good guy. Yeah, that, that answer your question? Good. Thank you, Nico. So in the first part, you had this one overkill case where you approximated the boundaries of the value of the Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that was the, the how good is my approximation on the boundary, yes. Can you just give a comment on if you also were to include H-adaptivity on the overkill case, 
how does that compare to the uh, nerves? Uh, calling the cat or without calling the cat? Uh, without calling the cat. But, bad boy, bad, 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 bad. <laughs> if you do age, but you stick with, uh, you, you are talking about this case here. Okay, so I've decided a priori that I will put here some cubic functions. And now you tell me, you leave this cubic function, but I refine in age. This function is smooth. I'm going to get the same thing as increasing polynomials of order 11 here. I won't gain anything by just refining in age. Because what I need to do, even if they look the, the exact boundary and the cubics, the piecewise cubics, seem very similar, what I need to do is to change the piecewise cubics. This stagnation is due to the geometry error. Well, not this one, actually, this one is due to the geometry error. Mm -hmm. And unless you call, if you call the cat, that's a different story. Uh, if, if you refine and call the cat, it's like if you use isoparametric elements. Okay, you go back to the original geometry and therefore you decrease the error in the geometry. But if you don't call the cat, you will not be able. That's the advantage of using from the beginning the exact geometry. Nicole, yes. Next one. I don't know. I know it took out. out. This. Yeah. Your, your error estimator is very, very sweet. I expect error. Yes. So it's very nice. Um, do you have a bound how much you would expect it to differ from the rate? No. Uh, no, no. No, we don't have analytical bounds for that. Uh, because the analysis. I mean, I can do it a little bit more sophisticated than this, but at the end, this gives you very clearly, very intuitively what, what's, what we do. It's like, it's like if you solve, I, I remember a very important professor in Caltech telling me, all these issues about error estimation, uh, at the end you compute it with P, and then you compute it with P plus one, you subtract and you have an information of the error, okay? And I say, well, well, yes, but P plus one sometimes is very expensive and we don't want to do that. And this is why we invent all the different error estimators. Well, what we do here is exactly his approach, in a sense. But instead of computing the whole domain with P plus one, we do this post-processing element by element with P plus one, which give us the same thing, the solution with one order more. Okay. So you have the solution with one order more, you can do the difference, but that the bounding of this with respect to the exact error in the limit is reasonable, but not um, before that. Sure. No more questions? Yes. Okay. The jets, yes. Of course. No, no. What we have is the continuous. What we have is that we, we have an expression that tells us for every value of the jet and every point, the velocity. So we have a continuous variation because we have a function of the jet multiplied by a function of the space. And we have six of those eh, with, that we add. So I just plotted three examples. But to compute another one is simply to evaluate those functions, multiply them, and sum them. So that's the beauty of the PGD. And, and if you tell me, can you, can you compute now what is the influence on the vertical velocity here of what is the derivative of the jet of, of, the, of the velocity here due to the jet, C can you compute the, the, the derivative of u here with respect to the amplitude of the jet? And I can compute it because I have an analytical, exp analytical. I have an analytical approximation of the velocity here as a function of this point and the value of the jet. So I can compute the influence of this. 
In the geophysical problem that I was showing somebody, you before, this is what we did. We computed the temperature in that problem and the parameters, the, the temperature was depending on the parameters. And the question is, is the temperature go going to change a lot in this point when I change the value of the parameters? And you saw that in some places yes and in others don't. So the well should be put in the places where the temperature changes a lot and I can take measures out of it. There were questions, Tim? Anyway, this is a follow-up. Um, if you were to, did you do a uh, uncertain qualification? <laughs> if you wanted to go for higher order derivatives, have you got any idea how long these higher order derivatives, for, for which order they will be, still be somewhat accurate when you use just your approximation? This goes back to the answer that I, this is why we, for the, for the, uh, parametric functions for the parametric modes, we also use weak forms to try to get as high order as we can. Uh, let me say it in a different way. If you want to derivate the function with respect to the parameters, what you want to know is which is the order of the error of the derivatives, okay? In this problem here. <coughs> if I understood well your question, what you are telling me is, I have the velocity at any point, for instance, 0, 0, and as a function of the jet, okay? And uh, I just answer her that I can compute the derivative of u with respect to the jet at any point and for any jet. And now you tell me, how good is this approximation? Well, how good was this approximation? This approximation was of the order of h. h now discretization of in space and discretization in mu, k plus 1. What order will be this one? hk. And if k is large enough, I can take more derivatives, which was your question, wasn't it? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, hey, very good question. No. You got me. No. No, 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 no. You, you are killing me. No. Uh, uh, HDG works for second order problems. We need the mixed. The, the whole point of HDG. Yeah, yeah. Very, very extremely good question. The, the, whole, the whole idea of HDG is the mixed, the famous mixed variable where I but I began a little bit, a little bit mathematician, and I talked about this Arnold Winter element and so on. The whole trick of HDG is that L converges with k plus one, and this is the boundary condition. This L, which converges as k plus one, once I've solved it, is my boundary condition for the for the superconvergent problem. Here. My boundary condition here is the L. Is the L that I just computed, the one that converges as k plus 1. Okay? So I need the L to do the superconvergence. And the L is the derivative of u. And if I have a second order problem, two divergence of the gradient, the gradient is L. But if I have a pure uh, Euler equations, if I have, I don't have second derivatives. So in that case, it just gives you uh, the same number as dt. Yes. Uh, if, but, so I want to ask, like, if, if I can dt if you add a reaction term, let's say for a transfer diffusion, then you can just get... No, it, no. If you add artificial diffusion, yes. Yeah, yeah, but if you add reaction, no. Oh, no reaction. No, if you, no because the reaction is not a second order, it's not a, uh, a second order so term. It's, reaction is usually function times u. Yes, all of this, well, look, I, st I talked Stokes and I talked, uh, so I didn't talk about the convection, okay? Uh, th but the answer is, all the convection part works exactly the same as in any of these continuous Galerkin classical technique. 
So, in fact, when we solve with HDG uh, uh, Navier Stokes problem, the diffusion part is the Stokes part that I just explained, and the convection part, we do it with an approximate Riemann solver. So, you put reaction, I will do it as a, as a hyperbolic problem. For Euler or compressible uh, Navier Stokes, all the convection part is treated as Euler, as standard DG, the diffusion part is treated like this. But most of the time, the quantities of interest are, dra are uh, drugs and lifts and things like that, which is where the viscosity is important. And then the estimator is crucial.